Okay, so welcome everyone to another session. And today's got, I got an exciting session for everyone here. All right, so let's get right into it. As you know, we have been doing this series, it's called The Road to Revelations and Beyond. Uh, we are doing an unrestricted study on biblical eschatology. And it's going to be really in deep as we've been seeing. And uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us. But one thing I want everyone to take from this study is to keep an open mind, to be at the feet of Christ, study for yourselves. Whatever I am showing you, whatever information I give, please use it and make your own study. And if the study convicts you, then uh, there are things and decisions we each of us has to take. All right. So let's move forward. So today's agenda, we'll be looking at the seven churches. Specifically, we'll be looking at the church of Ephesus and what, what was lost or what was the problem that they faced and that was first love. All right. Okay. So now, when you start off, we saw last time how Jesus was introducing himself and how God introduced uh, Jesus into the picture. Right? We saw that the book of Revelation is not the complete name of the book. It is actually the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's either Jesus guy is being revealed through the book, through this book, or Jesus is revealing things, or a combination of both, where Jesus is being revealed and what Jesus is revealing to us. So it's very important for us to know the scriptures, to be able to understand what is going on, right? And so this is how he says about the seven churches. Now, uh, chapter 2, verse 11, he says, saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. We saw that part last time. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyteria, to Sardis, Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. So what you can see here is the book of Revelation. Now, when was this written? There's a there's a there's one two dates okay one is the popular date and one is the traditional date okay the traditional date says that it was written in round about in uh, 95 AD so at that time uh, Caesar domination was the one ruling so this is the traditional date then a second date was suggested and that date is suggested under Nero which is AD 65 now what's the problem with these two dates? As you can see, there's almost 30 years difference. The other problem is, when why are they looking at Nero? The reason they're looking at Nero is because when you do the calculation of 666, the numerical value of 666 in equivalent to letters would become uh, Kaiser Nero. And because of that and some other these things, they started to say that you know, uh, Paul, John was writing it when Nero was uh, Caesar. So therefore, that date became also uh, you know, started to be promoted. But the thing is, this date, the or the later date, which is AD 95, was the most accepted date till 1752. There was no other contest between another date. But from 1752 is where this problem started. Anyway, that's, uh, that's a different topic, but I just wanted to let you guys know regarding the seven churches and especially uh, Book of Revelation. Now, when you talk about the seven churches, what is the seven church today? Seven churches today are nothing but historical sites. They are, uh, how do you say, tourist places or places for pilgrims. It has been reduced to that level now. Now, the seven churches today in existence are what the Catholic Church has said that these are the seven churches. They are the ones pointing the finger around showing you which are the seven churches. But apart from that, what you need to understand is in those days when Paul is writing letter to Ephesus or letter to Corinth or letter to whichever uh, region he's talking about. He's talking about a region, not a specific church. So the churches at that time were not able to gather in large congregations outside in public places or even in big, uh, you know, big places like we can do today. No, they couldn't do that. So they were all underground. They were gathering in homes, uh, in, in uh, you know, places where it's not public. Okay, and they were all secretive meetings. So what the house? So the house church is what was the real deal. Whenever you see the church and all talking about in the New Testament, they're always, most of the time, they're talking about house churches. Okay. So in Greek, the house church was called oikos. 
back home when i was in uh, in kerala this is how we used to address our care cells care cells were called oikoses house churches and this is how the beginning of the church is it's always in someone's house we have so many verses in the scripture that's talking about house churches and i'll give you some of them you have first corinthians 16:19 we're just talking about uh, priscilla and aquila uh, and the house and the church which is in their house so they had a church, house church in at their place and then uh, you have roman 16 3 and 5 again talking about their house church you have in philemon 1 and 2 verse 1 and 2 you have uh, another house church being mentioned so that house is belonging to afia right then the next one is in colossians 4:15 you see in laodicea there's another house church and so and, and then you see another one in acts chapter 2 verse 46 to 47 right so house churches was what was the beginning foundations of the church not cathedrals not the big halls that we see today not any fanfare nothing they were just small places where few people gathered if it was a bigger house like an influential person they had a bigger place they used to gather there either way it was not in public right because it was very secretive anybody know what is the fish symbol that you see stuck on uh, cars does anybody know what it means sorry which emblem can you repeat the question you know on cars we stick a fish emblem oh fish okay. has anybody seen it yes yes do you know what it means believer sorry a follower of christ yeah so the, what the, what it was indicate it was a secret signal that the christians used to use in those days they used to use their feet to draw it in the ground once they drew it in the ground that is how they identified each other today we stick it on our cars in, in those days they used to use it as secret of communication to identify one another you would find it on walls where they wrote um, messages for other people yes so it is a means of communication or identification so that's how the issue was they were not having the freedom to express their faith and if they did they would be you know severely punished all right so the question that we need to ask going back to revelation chapter 2 verse 11 where he is telling john to write these things whatever he sees whatever he hears write it in a book and send it to the seven churches so technically when you look at it from a contextual point the book of revelation of jesus christ was addressed to the seven churches which are in asia minor which are these seven churches why is the book addressed to the seven churches why not as we know during paul's time the book that was uh, the the churches that were existence was first corinth the corinthians was there the uh, thessalonians was there um, you had um, which else a roman church was later on but they were also the established why he didn't write it to address to the galatians uh, to the other churches which are there in europe why is it only asia minor now that question i have not got an answer yet but i will be looking into it very deeply now because this question is very much important because he is addressing it to the seven churches only is it not applicable to us now seven periods of history so yes exactly so the thing is there is a teaching that is out there which talks about the seven churches although they are seven churches but they are also seven time periods and for a long period of time that after i heard this i considered it to be you know somewhat accurate but since i started the study uh, i started to look deeper into it and then i started to find flaws okay i'm not completely disregarding it i'm going to keep it but i'm going to show you what the flaws that i found okay and they are big big flaws not small ones now if you look at i'm going to show you four different time periods that they have put out there okay i want you to pay close attention to these dates and to the 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 chart on the le- on the right is based on dispensation as written right at the bottom okay so it's based on dispensation okay dispensation is a doctrine that we 
currently use in the Pentecostal churches and many of the other, uh, some of the traditional churches, but not all. But if you're a Pentecostal, then you are following this doctrine. Okay. So the first one says Ephesian church period is AD 96. And the subsequent on the, uh, uh, the picture on the right, you will see it is during what period? It is showing you 33 to 100 AD. Then you look at Smyrna. The Smyrna church period they're showing is from 100 to 313 AD. And it's almost identical in the, uh, in the, in the picture on the right, except it is one year less. It's 312 AD. Then you go to Pergamos. You see it's 313 to 606 AD. And on the picture on the right, you see it is at what date? It is at, uh, it's another date again. There's, there's a difference there. 312 to 590. Yeah. My, my slide is also very small, so I'm trying to see it very nice. <laughs> Let me just see it. Yeah, it's 312 to 580, right? Or 550? 590. 590. 590. Okay. So, the, so you see subsequent dates when you look at each of them, it begins to change and shift without any consequence. Look at this. Titeria is now 606 to 1517. And in the right one, it is 590 to 1570. Okay, one date is similar. Then you go to Sardis. It goes 1517 to 1739. And in the other one, it goes 1517 to 1750. Okay, there's a 50, there's an 11-year increase. Then Philadelphia, 1739 to 1850. And what do you have on this side? You have 1750 to 1925 AD. Quite close. Then you see the Laodicean church over there. It's 1850 to 1917 plus. That means it keeps going. It doesn't end from 1917 onwards, right? While uh, on the right, it is 1925 to end. Absolutely no relation to these dates here. They both are in complete the differences when it comes to the later churches, right? Now, let's move forward to the next church, next set. In the next set, again, Ephesus is 31 to 100. On the right, also the same dates. Smyrna is 100 to 313. Here also, it's following like the second one in the previous uh, slide. Then you have Pergamos, 313 to 538, whereas here it is 312 to 606. And Thyteria is 538 to 1500s. Now, on the other side, look at what it's saying. Carefully, use, if you can see it, uh, Achuk, can you just enlarge that area? I don't know if I can with the... Uh... Okay, uh, then I'll just, I'll just read it out to you guys. Yeah. In Titeria, it says 606 to tribulation. Oh, I can look. <laughs> you can, right? Yeah. Look at Titeria, it says it is 606 to tribulation. Then Sardis on the right, on the left, it says from 1500s to 1790s. Whereas on the right, it goes 1750 to rapture. Okay. And six, Philadelphia, 1719s to 1840s. On the left, it is 1900s to tribulation. But that's uh, Laodicea. Thing. Yeah, Laodicea. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I read the thing again. Laodicea is 1840s to second coming on the, on the, on the left. While on the right, It is 1900s to tribulation again. And then you see on the top, it says rapture of the church. So there's a rapture in Sardis church, uh, sorry, in Philadelphia church. And there's a rapture here in Laodicean church. Both of them are involved in the rapture. Now, are these dates agreeing with one another? First question. 
What do you guys think? Can we go by time periods? Anyone? Can we use time periods to define the seven churches? I don't think so. Because if it is time periods, then everybody should be in the right manner, not up and down, you know. It's just a guess, probably, or an understanding based on certain things that they've read or understood. You're right in that sense, because when you have such huge variations of dates, what is the deciding factor to decide what is the start date and what is the end date? How do you make these decisions and choices? I, I really don't know what was the what was behind the choices of these dates. I truly cannot figure out what is the uh, what the picture on the right has to do with the how they say the rapture, tribulation, and this. It doesn't make any sense to me. I think it's down by many people, isn't it? Is as people understood, they have put it down. It's not by one. So, so these are all based on doctrinal differences. Especially the one right now, which you're seeing on the right side, I think it has something to do. It, I don't know which doctrine it is following. I honestly do not know. So it becomes very difficult for someone to look and learn because it's going to get confusing. Either I choose uh, out of these four dates, I don't even know which one should I use to teach people. Right. So that's why dates and periods, I feel you can keep it as an idea, but I wouldn't suggest um, basing a study on it. So when you think about it this way, so then how do I interpret what is the function of these seven churches? Why mention seven churches? Why talk about uh, revelations as being addressed to the seven churches? So one thing that came to my heart was this. If you look at the seven churches as examples, and you liken to the them as a, like a parable. Think about it this way. Uh, everybody know about the parable of the sower, right? Yes. So in the parable of the sower, the, the soil is actually talking about people's hearts, right? Yes. What if, okay, that we all know that the four grounds talks about individual people or you can take it as collectively. Yeah, you can talk about as, as a singular person. And you can also uh, attribute the same four grounds as collectiveness, like as even type of churches or type of people that you'll see in the church, right? If you think in that manner, actually, you can click it, you can show that picture. So you can see the first one is the wayside, then you have the stony ground, then you have the thorny ground, and then you finally have the good ground. So we all know what these definitions are when it comes to individual people or even collectively. If you think in that manner, can the seven churches also signify conditions that you will see in the churches presently and that you're going to commonly encounter them even today? It is like seven different versions of people or churches that you will find. What do you think? Is yes. it a possibility? Yes. I feel that has got more traction than dates. Yes. It'll be easier for me to study now. Okay. Yes. So, although there are specific things that are mentioned in those seven churches, uh, pertaining to those seven churches, but I feel on a larger scale, it, it applies to different bodies that are out there today. And you can, we can all take lessons from it because it, apply, it can be applied to us. Because if, it, if I say these churches are ages, then what happens is technically we are all Laodicean churches. Yes. If we are all Laodicean churches, I should not be finding traits of Ephesus, Smyrna or Pergamos or anybody, any other churches uh, traits inside the Laodicean church because it is a completely different uh, Thing that is there in Gaudi's in church. Agreed? Anybody do not agree with this? Or feel there's the dates have also good traction? Guys, you can answer. Don't worry. Yeah. 
Okay. I think nobody wants to say anything. Anyway, we'll look at these time periods as we go through the study, as we're going to, into each one. So let's look at the church of Ephesus, which is the first church, which uh, Jesus is addressing. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. You have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has a ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now we're going to break down these, these into sections. And that sections are as the color coded that you see on the screen. So first we're going to look at the blue, then we're going to look at the orange, and then we, finally we're going to look at the, uh, the, 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 what color is that? Blue, black, and then the green, right? Green, yeah. Yeah. So, first of all, the start of where Ephesus is located. Ephesus is located today in Turkey. It is on the western uh, section of Turkey, of modern day, of western shore of modern day Turkey. Now, what is the history of this church? It is said John the Apostle was living here and he died here in Ephesus. It is recorded that he died in Ephesus. And during his tenor here in Ephesus, he has Mary, the mother of Jesus, also staying with him. Nobody knows whether she died in Ephesus or not, but definitely Mary was in Ephesus along with John for a long period of time. Okay. Now, how this church began, this church began with 12 members. All right. It starts with 12 members and Paul preaching about baptisms. That's how it all, it all starts. And it's recorded in Acts chapter 19, 4 to 7. When you read it, you will find out this is the, this is the uh, discussion that's going on where Paul is asking, have you heard about the Holy Spirit? And these, uh, these two people that tell him that we have not even heard of the Holy Spirit. Then he's asking them, what were you baptized with? Though he says we were baptized in John's baptism. Oh, so John indeed preached the baptism of repentance. But then he starts teaching them regarding the baptism of Jesus Christ and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And after he says that, and then, you know, the Spirit comes upon them and these men start to speak in tongues. And that's how this church starts with 12 people. Now, seeing this move of God in their life, Paul stays in Ephesus for three years and he's teaching them. Now, when I say Paul was teaching there for three years, I am talking the teaching is so intense. And as you see in the book of Acts, Paul is not a person who's, who has a teaching like for say one hour or one and a half hours. We can see records of him teaching well into the night. Yes. In such a situation, his three years of teaching was so intense and it was daily. It is not weekly. It would have been daily because that was where he used to. He used to go daily and start teaching these people. When you have such an intense teaching of say, like say, even if you take five to 10, five, anywhere between five to 10 hours is what my range is of his teaching per day. Think about him teaching five to 10 hours for 365 days a year for three years. How many hours of teaching do you think it's gone into? It's in thousands. And we can see when you read the book of Ephesians, how strong the teaching is. It's intense. Everybody's read the book of Ephesians, right? Is it intense or not? It's quite intense. Okay, now I'm going to give you a little background of the church of Ephesus or what's happening in Ephesus. Ephesus was a worship center, like how we have cert certain cities that are known for, say, maybe uh, like Disneyland. Florida is known for Disneyland. Okay, everybody go to Florida for it. Okay. Ephesus was known for the worship of the goddess Diana. 
and this temple of diana that was there was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world okay not present world ancient world there some of those things are there now we don't have any of them remaining the only thing that is remaining i think is the great wall of china from the ancient world hanging gardens of babylon was there temple of diana was there there was the colossus of rhodes which was like a huge statue standing on two islands right then they had uh, i think they had some a mirror or something uh, anyway I, i don't know all of them but just to say that this was one of the seven wonders of the world in the ancient days now we have a write up regarding this in acts chapter 19 26 to 28 a mention of this where you have this big ruckus that is going on because paul and his disciples were teaching regarding uh, jesus christ and then the people there started to rebel or they started to fight back and look at what they are saying here moreover you see and hear that not only at ephesus but throughout almost all of asia so this worship is not local it is all over this paul has persuaded and turned away many people saying that they are not gods which are made with hands so not only is this trade of ours falling into disrepute but also the temple of the great goddess diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed whom all asia and the world worship please underline this in your scriptures that diana was not only worshiped in asia but perhaps the entire world also okay now when they had heard this they were full of wrath and cried out saying great is diana of the ephesians now what was so unique about this thing was the the thing they had an image that was uh, worshiped inside this temple and that image is said to have come from heaven and i'll come to that but who is diana diana for the romans for the greeks she is diana but when you come to the romans she is artemis okay and if anybody is confused as to the diagram on the, the picture on the left yes those are actually multiple breasts she was a goddess of uh, sex okay. and many other things this 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 goddess had breasts all over all right so it is very grotesque in that manner artemis on the other hand did not have this kind of picture she is called the goddess of the hunt so she was known for uh, her powers as a warrior as a hunter she was a huntress right and one of her emb- symbols was the deer now this worship of diana was quite prevalent in those days the only thing the thing is we get confused whenever we look into ancient history and we look at religions and stuff like there's so many names out there that we get all confused it is quite quite impossible or quite difficult to wade through these gods and goddesses that we'll come across but this is one example i'll give you diana worship also was like a false trinity she had she was a three form goddess right she was called by different titles based on where she was addressed if she was addressed in heaven that was she was called also called the queen of heaven she is called luna when you go to her earthly form she is called diana so in the picture you will see the heavenly form is the one on the left right sorry the heavenly form is the one in the middle so that's where you have the full moon so she is also a moon goddess the one on the right, on the left is artemis which is on earth or diana so she is the goddess of the hunt so she's got the bow and the arrow and she is in white okay and the one on the right extreme right is the uh, the representation of same goddess in hell where she is called proserpina or otherwise in hecate so she had three forms all three forms depending whether she is celestial earthly or uh, other worldly this is her image now acts chapter 19 verse 35 it says that when the death city clerk had quieted the crowd he says men of ephesus what man is there who does not know that the city of ephesians is temple guardian to the great goddess diana and of the image that fell down from zeus what is this image that fell down from zeus it's actually a meteorite so there's a whole study behind it if if you are interested you can look at meteorite worship you can write it down look into it it's called meteorite worship and what all it curtailed 
in those days meteorites were uh, were seen as how do you say heavenly objects or sent down by the gods and in this case this image that whatever fell down whatever kind of meteorite it looked like it they attributed to zeus and zeus is the chief god of the pantheon okay this is the background of what all is happening in the background of this where this church is born okay this is how god penetrated into a completely dark region and when he penetrated start with 12 people please understand these numbers okay 12 is the number of perfect governance okay 10 is perfect law 12 is perfect governance that is why you have everything divided into 12s right so throughout scripture i'm not going into it now throughout scripture sevens are quite common 12s are quite common tens are also common so you can look into it at at your own uh, time but i will come to it maybe later on during the studies so the church of ephesus was a mighty church that god had established i am talking about nothing you will ever see in your lifetime probably or even i might not even see it okay and christ is affirming the might of this church in revelation chapter 2 look at what he is saying here i know your works your labor your patience that you cannot bear those who are evil you have tested those who are say they are apostles and they are not you have found them as liars and you have persevered and have patience and you have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary what a what a address jesus is giving to this church they are saying you are able to find out for false teachers apostles whatever it is you are able to test them he you are able to find out what the lies they are teaching you are able to persevere in patience and by the way what would you call a church of this mag- of this magnitude how would you term today if you saw a church like this guys you can talk because it's uh, this is this has to be an interactive study i cannot be the only one talking in other words is this is this a perfect church or is this a mediocre church or is it a lukewarm church it's a it's a very powerful church i think it's a very powerful church it's a very powerful church you are right the church was very active very involved what is the gift that you require to be able to find out who is right uh, like who is a uh, false apostle who is not you need to have the holy spirit to discernment be... yes you need to have the gift of discernment moving around in this in this uh, this thing when you have that kind of a situation this church was a very how do you say very act, spiritually alive church right they are able to do so many things that we currently are not even able to do have you in your lifetime seen a church like this no i don't think that's why i said i might not see it in my lifetime either no right so false apostles and teachers were a reality then and they are a reality even today yes yes so today this kind of discernment is it required or not it is very much required. required it is very much required you need to know okay but what happened the today what's happening is we are not able to make discernment we do not have this kind of giftings that we see that jesus talking about the ephesian church had the problem is biblical knowledge we don't have knowledge spiritual awareness and empowerment in the church today is bankrupt why because again no teaching people are more concerned about their well being than which matters to god anji they too busy ah uh, john sir can I, yeah i can i ask you something else because you are saying it's about teaching and all that stuff but then what about people who basically call out uh, you know false prophets or you know false teaching don't you think the church basically or 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 your you know fellow believers try to suppress because you know somebody falls into that kind of a trap and when somebody says no this is not right or this is like this mm. they tend to be sidelined so yes. that might not be because of the teaching because there are people i was just thinking when you said to check up on uh, the church of ephesus mm-hmm. you know, um, one thing that struck me was you know everybody 
was into uh, you know idol worship and you know all, all sorts of uh, wrong things but then the christians who were there you mm. know they they uh, stood out and you know they uh, they were burdened and then you know their uh, fire went on from from 0 to 100 you know it's, it's like that they 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 uh, you know preserve through perseverance you know mm. out here now also in churches like very few are there who are you know persevering but many of them then they fall into this kind of a trap i, I don't think it might be not just because of teaching alone see mm. teaching kind of tends you to uh, sideline yourself or to think in a certain manner you have to do it on your own you always say you know like study the word on your own and then ask discernment from the holy spirit so right. i feel it's basically about an understanding what you get you know mm. no just want things, to what you are seeing is an aftermath where it starts okay. is when the teaching goes off fair fair enough fair enough yeah okay okay so once you start with the wrong teaching and then what happens is subsequently as the time progresses the the people's understanding of scripture changes has changed if it once it changes enough remember i said a 1 degree deviation over a period of time can become very big yes just yes. with 1 degree so same way see satan is not a stupid fellow he knows exactly what 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 to do and so he doesn't teach you all wrong things he'll teach you one wrong thing from that one wrong thing we go to many wrong things this is what where we we miss the whole point we don't need a whole lot of wrong teaching to make everything wrong we just need one thing now mind the thing that we need to understand is the people in ephesus are already combating what are they fighting against they're fighting this this cult of diana that is already so so entrenched into society they are so entrenched into society and as you saw the diana was a sex goddess so sexual uh, perversions and these kind of things was quite common in these places and they were already loving it there right and then you have the, uh, the doctrine of jesus christ coming into the mix and god is moving in these people but understand what is the society like around them even today our society we have not actually looked at what's happening where our children are going what are they facing uh, we are only stuck in our four walls most of the time this is the problem parents don't know what's happening in the child's life or what's happening in schools and around we are not aware of it so therefore the indoctrination is coming into the church through children forget even adults it's coming through the children because children are being taken as aside the adults are confused as to what is going on on one other side so it's coming from different angles this church was no better this church also was having attack from all sides and another thing that you need to understand is there was great revival because of this church look at acts chapter 19 verse 20 18 to 20 it will show you the might of this church the church grew rapidly it's not just one or two people it's like from that 12 it just exploded and many who practiced occult burned their books we are talking about people who were actually into witchcraft and uh, serious uh, you know demonic things bringing out their books now these books that you hear here we, i don't know if anybody can even name one of them but there were many books in those days right some of which are uh, i can't even say their names i don't want to say their names but they brought them out and publicly burnt them and i think in that chapter they will tell you what was the value of the books that was burnt and if i am not mistaken to my memory i think they have even mentioned the value of those books so this is the level of more god's movement that was there in ephesus is it something something that is small no it was major with all this we would think such a church would have changed the entire landscape the entire spiritual atmosphere of the whole land would have changed because of the church of ephesus what a mighty church starting with 12 people and paul investing 3 years of his life into that church god knows how many hours of teaching i would say it is in thousands and thousands of hours in those 3 years the amount of knowledge paul imparted to these people was 
I, I don't even know how, how to say it. Because if you look at the, um, the prayer of Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, he's saying that the eyes of your understanding yet light. See, his, he wanted Ephesians to be able to see even more things. And you see him talking about the powers of the principalities and the four levels of demonic realm that is there. This is not there in any of the other books. But it is there in the Ephesians book of Ephesians. So you can understand with even with a slight this thing that how intense these people were. And we would think that such a church would be successful in life. However, with all their pursuits and all the things that they achieved, even, even revival, which we pray for on a regular basis to happen in our place, something happened here. What happened? God had one question to them, uh, one, one fault. And what was the fault that he found with them? He said that you have forsaken your first love. Yeah. What does that even mean? And he says this also, return to your, your former works, your works of first love. Come to back to that. We need to understand what is that. So what have they been doing? They're able to discern apostles. They're able to discern wrong doctrine. They're able to discern this, that. They had uh, spiritual awareness, uh, abuse into demonic realms, and all that. And then he's saying, you don't have first love. So that means you can go high into, uh, into spirit levels without first love. So what, what are we doing then? Then we are like robots? Ranji, what did you say? Without? Without first love. Oh, first love. Okay. They're doing all these mighty works without first love. Ranji, when they were taught the word of God, they took it in totality. They Simple. absorbed it so much mm -hmm. that they were convicted to the core of their inner man. They were willing to get let everything that will pollute them go out of their life. But in the when people receive Christ, that totality is missing. Hmm. Everything happens like a superficial uh, transformation, like it is not total transformation. And I think uh, uh, like uh, the, the pursuit of perfection, because nowadays what you see is everybody who is supposed to be having faith or going to church, they have a set... Uh, agenda as far as worship is concerned, prayer is concerned, I should not do this, I should not do that, or I should not. Essentially, understanding another person or accepting somebody uh, in, in God's love is not like suddenly like I am perfect, the other person is wrong, that person has done this. So, you know, we are trying to point fingers. So, probably when they come to Christ, it is like that. But then the more they understand, I think, uh, you know, that that small, that small degree of variation as it progresses, it becomes really big and they are blinded. It is because it's more of doctrines that is being taught, not um, the love of Christ or the gospel that God wanted to impart into people, salvation messages in reality. It's, it's more of doctrinal issues that is being sp spoken of even in the church. Pentecostal groups, they will teach what they want to teach. They will not get into the uh, the truth of the word 100%. Okay. So, so the thing is, uh, maybe, yeah. uh, probably, it may be something like the difference between New Testament and Old Testament. In which in Old Testament, you had laws which are given by Moses. So, in means just like that. In New Testament, what Jesus wants is to do obey uh, from the law, isn't it? Now right. it is going into something like obey, like laws. Kind of. Yeah, kind of. So what is this? So when you look at a, uh, a church that is involved in re a revival, and that means this church was quite active. I keep, I keep coming back to this church as being active. What do you call a church that is like, like efficient church? The description, we would say, oh, that's a church, mighty revival, very lively. There is fire in that church. Wouldn't, wouldn't you put that in the description? On, in today's terms, yes. Because but yet, Jesus is telling, you are doing all of this without first love. So he loves, his value for first love 
is greater than all this fanfare that you're seeing. So the question I want you to ask yourselves is, what does Jesus really value then? Is it accomplishments in the spiritual realm or is it basics? Basics for sure. And this will tell you why he said Mary has chosen the better part when he's talking to Martha. It's not about what you accomplished. It's loving him, desiring him, seeking him, which is more important to than the activities or the involvement that you do. So the question we need to ask today is, where is our heart today? Are we walking in the zeal, the love, the excitement that we had when we first came to the Lord? I need. I think we must go back to our starting point and see how we felt the first time we accepted Christ, what moved me to accept him and what was my life immediately during those periods of times? What was the level of dedication I had? What was my Bible reading? What was my prayer life? What was my fellowship like? What was that? I think we need to go back and examine those roots of our own life, right? So the Ephesians today, those church, the church of Ephesians like that day, today we have many church activities. And many church activities and many things in the church has, has cultivated, right? A kind of a Christian walk without the essence of what it means to be a follower of Christ. We are doing stuff. We get a lot of things done. We keep moving around and everybody will say, oh, Renji is, oh, he's so involved. Uh, he's got, he's on fire. God only knows what Renji is like. Right? I might look very spiritual. I might do a lot of things that are spiritual. I might speak words that are spiritual, but my inner soul condition, only God only knows. So this is where the problem is with the Ephesian church also. And Jesus warning these people that he will come to them quickly if they don't repent and he will remove their lampstand. So when he's saying that coming quickly and removing, okay, coming quickly, uh, let's not talk about that now. But I want to examine what it means to take out a lampstand. Now, biblically, what, what the lampstand means, it's actually the light, right? God's light or Rema word. The menorah. When you say lampstand, it goes directly to menorah. The menorah was actually located in the holy place, right? The holy place, you had the menorah on the left side, you had the table of showbread on the right, and then slightly off-centered was the altar of incense right in front, slightly towards up, uh, to the left side. So the menorah was the only light source inside the holy place. So therefore, it is symbolic of one spirit life. God's leading in your life. God's word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So it shows me the way I need to go. So if the light is taken out, what happens? I'll be a man without direction, right? Yes, no? When God's light is removed from you, you would be like a blind spiritual man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but we have, we have schedules in place. That no, we're not talking about schedules in place, Mommy. We are talking about God's light being removed. Forget yeah, schedules. but who, who is seeking God's light when you don't have your own agendas put down? That is when you look for what do you want to do today? Lord, what do you want me to do today? Yeah, okay. Okay. Ah, English. Ah, English. Nobody is doing it. You have English, already English, English. So you no longer receive word from lord in the terms of being revealed things what what thing is how you must go what is your uh, what he wants you to do today or something like that in that manner but more spiritually aware of what god is telling you rather than be assuming stuff right that is one way of looking at the lampstand being taken out can it can it be losing salvation without god's light without god's direction would salvation be in jeopardy? Yes, no? Yes. So salvation can be in jeopardy. Yes, it, it can be. 
Okay. When 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 you when you basically lose the essence of you being in Christ, mm -hmm. uh, then then what's the point? Actually, uh, nowadays uh, most of them want you know, like we all. I mean, not not most of them. I mean, all of us who are in Christ per se want to be taken. Uh, like if you are alive, when Christ comes, we have to be taken. So when yeah. the salvation or the essence or the 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 flavor of the salt is taken off from us, then it, what's it, point it, it, What's the point of the salt? You're right. Exactly. So keep that in mind. Salvation could be in jeopardy when God is telling to the Ephesian church, I'll take away your lampstand. Okay. Now, contextually, now let's look at contextually. The book of Revelation tells you that the lamp represents church. Yes. Lampstand represents church. Church. In, Re in Revelation chapter 1, he's telling you the lampstand is actually church. Church. So contextually, if you remove the, when he's saying, I'm going to remove the lampstand, what is he saying? Remove the church. church. Remove the church. Yeah. When he's telling, I will remove the lampstand from you, Ephesians. Remove the light. He was removing light from where? From the church or from Ephesus? From Ephesus. He's taking it away from Ephesus. In other words, he's revoking the ambassadorship of the present church of Ephesus or the present church at Ephesus. Yes. Look at this. If God's expectation of us is not meeting with the standards that is required, he could remove us from ambassadorship. Remove us from being representatives of him. Is that possible? Yes. What do you think? Possible? Not possible? Yes. Possible. Yes, possible. Isn't that a sad ending for such a vibrant yes. church? Yes, yes. Very such, a, such a horrible ending. Now, next point that I, that we talked about in that uh, in about the Ephesian church is that you hate the Nicolosians. Anybody know what are Nicolosians or who they are? Has anybody come across Nicolosianism? Nobody knows about it. No. Okay. Gnostics saying. Uh, no, they're not Gnostics. That is a different set. But mm -hmm. Nicolosians are quite, uh, I'll tell you the origin. Okay. Uh, the early church father, Irenaeus, he wrote about them. He says they were the followers of Nicholas of Antioch. Now, who's Nicholas of Antioch? He was one of the seven chosen to serve the church along with Stephen. He's mentioned in Acts chapter 6, verse 5. This man called Nicholas. So he started off, now when you look at the, the criteria for choosing those seven, he says, let's choose men who are full of the spirit, filled with the spirit and able to and able bodied men to serve the widows that were there in the church, right? And they chose Stephen. So that level of anointing is there in these people's lives, okay? Now this guy, from that level of anointing, he went into making his own doctrine. And his, the primary core of his doctrine was unrestrained indulgence. So what was the Nicolosians involved in? They were taking too much liberty or excess liberty in the flesh. And Paul's warns against this kind of liberty taking in Galatians 5.13. He says, don't, don't go there. Okay. And what happened is these people started to encourage people to go and eat freely of the food that is offered to the idols and also to engage in sexual relationships outside of marriage. So they started to give, they saying, no problem, whatever you do in your, uh, in your life, it's okay because it's all earthly. What more matters, you know, is spiritual life. So they started to indulge in 
all these worldly things and they were coming in in a compromised relationship with the society that was existing around them at that time so the church and the world began to merge as i said diana worship was huge and you should go back and study what diana worship was all about and then you'll understand a little more deeper as to what is going on there hey renji brother uh, john apostle john was also present in Ephesus. yeah yeah he was there yeah yeah he also had to fight with these guys oh okay but from there he went to patmos he was actually um you know put there in patmos for for quite a while and then he came back to ephesus in this final days and he died there okay so this nicolaitanism was quite prevalent and it was quite you know moving around because people began to agree to a lot of things because they said okay you can go do this you can do that because it was their old lifestyle so that old lifestyle was accepted now in this new christian format so therefore a lot of people started to get involved in this and so this is probably could be one of the reasons why you have romans chapter 14 where paul is addressing the foods that you eat being offered to idols and you're eating it like nobody's business exactly exactly yeah now so i get spreading. it clear this thing was spreading from the asia minor going going there and by the way the seven people that were chosen they were all greeks yeah the name stephen nicholas they're all greek names they're not jews yep because they were offered they were chosen to cho- uh, to serve the gentile widows that was there gentile mean the greeks so they chose greek people to serve the ladies that are there so this is coming from west eastward And that's why sorry uh, can i ask yes, you something any you know this the first time i hear that the it's the same nicholas it's the same nicholas but any history did you read anything from history yeah. how he started so, doing this how he got uh, into this i don't know if how he, he got otherwise it's okay i don't have how he got into it but this is i am reading what uh, the early church father irenius wrote about it okay not only him there are other people who wrote about the nicolaitans that is one is clement of alexandria eusebius i have eusebius book i will look into it then i have read, of, I, read the, i have read the letters i read see yeah, he mentions this one okay so hippolytus of rome uh, epiphanus and jerome they all write about the nicolaitans and this i do, i really don't know what what made nicolas go in this direction probably he wanted to be accepted in society also this is a very big eye opener because a lot of things that we see in the society today now i know in western society it comes from this nicolaitan kind of way of teaching so the thing danger that we are looking at today is for our present day is when the church starts to accept doctrines that are from the world and they start putting it inside and they start engaging in these kind of things and you know promoting it it's one thing to do it yourself the other it's another thing to promote it God hates people who encourage others to sin. He will forgive your sin, but making a somebody else stumble—that is a complete no-no. He says, you know, it is better to hang yourself with a millstone and throw yourself in the in the sea if one of these people fall because of you. Your sin, God will forgive. Please understand that He will forgive you of your sin, but. please do not encourage sin in other people's life this is how is a vital but in this guy's case he started to preach his wrong doctrine and he started to pollute the entire uh, you know the whole land and what does god say regarding uh, to the church okay he gives them uh, good points then he gives them the bad news and then he says something in revelation 2 verse 7 he says he who has a ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches please understand what he's saying he says one church or many churches he's addressing the ephesians but he says spirit says to the churches this is why i feel the these are some of the statements that are there in these scriptures that i feel that ephesian church although he's addressing the ephesian church he's also addressing us today he's also addressing all the four other six churches that are following this advice is not just for the efficiency it is for all of us this is why i think this time period doesn't work that much 
what does he say to him who overcomes i will give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of god nice so he's emphasizing here on hearing right and overcome what contextually it means not losing your first love if you are able to overcome the, the temptation that you have in this world to be overly productive for god overly zealous and overly this with the and minusing the actual time you spend with him that is more valuable he's asking us to come back to that first love and be at his feet right and he's saying if you do so i will grant you to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of god what does that actually mean does he's implying that if you are unable to overcome you will not be able to eat of the tree of life now when you make that statement there it would make sense which what we said earlier when you say that you remove the lamp stand you no longer have direction no longer have guidance no longer have that it means your salvation could be in jeopardy am i going the right direction what do you guys think yes it's plausible yes 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 sir so jesus goes to save the lost not the guy who ran away yes not the absconder yes not the absconder he doesn't go out after the absconder absconder go went because of his own will the he lost means anything. he's not lost because of his own will he is just lost now that you are found you cannot be lost again and that there are scriptures that talks about you know for not en uh, entangling yourself with the you know things of this world and and you get into a mix you look like a knotted like hebrew sex yeah don't get entangled with the stuff that you left and you get stuck there so on the one hand you have the church that is facing all this diana worship and all the other abomination things that are going on on the on one side and during the same time period please understand the church was also being persecuted so the backdrop you have to see it's multiple facets don't just take one thing on one side the church is under severe persecution the church was persecuted for 300 years how many years 300 300 years 300 years i'm not talking about one or two years okay and in this case nero started it all he started off when the uh, when rome burnt he accused the christians of having burnt rome and that angered a lot of people no huh? he is the one who started the fire actually nobody knows that for sure i like looked into history there is no proof that he started it but there are how do you say he wanted to actually rebuild rome he wanted to make rome better so there was a whole area of rome that was like slums so he wanted that to be taken out and he was uh, voted against from doing that so he so they say he employed this ploy he burned the whole thing down and what burned down was the places he wanted to change <laughs> yeah, that's the old saying right uh, while while rome was burning nero was dancing no that actually is not true i checked it he was not even in rome that time he was somewhere else when if you are the culprit usually you won't be in the vicinity he's not dancing actually he was playing the lyre and he was singing that's what they say i actually have wanted to put that here but then i uh, said that it is not uh, historically it is not right it is somebody's anger uh, is like posting uh, wrong news on the net <laughs> in fact the going uh, the, the saying goes like this when rome was burning nero was playing the fiddle fiddle or like one instrument he was playing <laughs> that, historically that is not true okay so that's why i didn't put it here but anyway good you guys put it up <laughs> it's like it's like the emperor was uh, who had no dancing with no clothes uh, that's a different story now anyway so we all studied about what what god said and what those uh, sections are okay now i will show you what actually happened to the efficient church we know what they did we know what christ said up good things about them we know it was a mighty revival then you know spiritually awakened church and all and then finally what happened they lost their first love and then jesus warns them that if you do not 
return back to your first love and to the first works i will take away your lampstand and then god only knows what happens there and then he says who he who has a ear let him hear what the spirit says to the churches and he says i will give you if you overcome i will give you uh, to eat of the tree of life right now what happened to the ephesian church there's a discourse that paul says before he is leaving this he goes away and he says this to the elders of the ephesians look at acts chapter 20 verse 28 to 31 Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. He is addressing the Ephesian church elders. Okay, take heed for yourselves and to the flock. So watch yourself and watch the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. So you are responsible for them and for yourselves. To the shepherd of the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So he is giving. Paul is talking to the elders of the church that you are. very responsible for the people under you watch for yourselves and watch out for them because they have been purchased by the blood of christ for anybody in leadership please understand the one that god is giving to you under you you should guard them with your life spiritual life at stake here verse 29 for this i know that after my departure savage wolves will come in among you so he is he is giving them and he is not telling them maybe they will come no he is telling you they will 100% come when i am gone that means he was the chief guard once the chief guard is gone if the other guards are playing hooky they will come so in other words paul is telling them watch out but i know you will not watch out i have to say it wolves will come in after you and he'll come in among you not sparing the flock and also apart from them coming from externally into your flock he says also from among yourselves who oh, the elders will rise up people speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after who not after god but after themselves they will exalt themselves and as show that as if they have something to offer and they will take away people from the faith and he says therefore watch and remember that for 3 years again he goes back to the investment that he did for the church for 3 years i did not cease to warn everyone night and day so the teaching is how long morning one night hour and day. so let's just say that's why i said 10 hours imagine 10 hours he starts morning he finishes in the evening 10 hours of teaching yes that is 24 hours a day imagine how many hours are there in a year and multiply that into 3 you will get an average minimum of what amount hours of teaching he is giving if we are to compare ourselves today we get teaching maybe if you are a sunday to sunday christian you will get 40 minutes if at all the pastor gets 40 minutes okay yeah. in those 40 minutes if you have to make up to the level of teaching that the efficiency received it'll take you 127 years approximately <laughs> my god this is an approximate uh, calculation that <laughs> i was making around 120 years you will take to come to equivalency of what they had learned in 3 years so paul has poured out his life to these people today god is pouring out many things to us also okay and night and day he is crying and teaching them he is crying and teaching them can you imagine this man's passion and how he knows what is going to happen here he is telling i have done this i have done my part now he is like exhorting them elders to do your part but he knows as soon as he is gone savage wolves will come from outside and from inside people will grow you know sprouting weeds it will choke the entire church and exactly this is what is happening okay history records okay that gnosticism which any anti you just now had mentioned a couple of minutes back gnosticism took root during the period of 90 to 95 ad exactly as this book is written book of revelations and it caused and it was one of the primary reasons for the ephesian church to deviate gnosticism 
it is one of the most dangerous heresies that that, that threatened the early church i would say even to this church and i'll give you why during the first three centuries gnosticism was how do you say the counter doctrine that was there to the doctrine of christ now what is this gnosticism it's based on two false premises first is called dualism now dualism is actually an occult term uh, i'll i'll teach that maybe sometime in the, in the study itself i'll show you these things what is dualism dualism regards two things spirit and matter and what does it say anything that is in the uh, in matter is inherently evil that means we say oh flesh or oh, the flesh is evil so everything in the flesh is evil whatever is done in the flesh is evil okay but the so the the understanding is that whatever is in the spirit far outweighs that which is in the flesh so gnostics believe that anything done in the body even the grossest of sin has no meaning or value when, when it comes to the spirit life understanding what they're saying you can relate this to nicolaitanism now yes yeah after this gnosticism yeah. mean that knowledge can lead to salvation which yeah. one that's more true so the does it mean that knowledge can lead to salvation uh, kind of yeah. kind of i'm coming to that that's yeah. the second point so yeah, what they say that, is whatever you do in the flesh no matter how sinful it may be whatever level you pursue it it ha has no bearing on spirit life yeah yeah okay yeah. the second premise that they live on is higher knowledge these people valued knowledge to be of the highest value and in the sense here yeah. is gnosticism comes from the greek word gnosis gnosis means to know to give to yeah. understand something right to receive something and it claims that the they possess this higher knowledge but the source is not the bible correct remember they burned those occultic books correct yes. yeah what these guys did was they brought that and they brought this so what is gnosticism actually it is actually uh, how do you say um how do i say it um the esoteric judaism you know christianity also has an esoteric side many religions has an esoteric side that esoteric side is this hidden knowledge that is there it is there in islam it is there in christianity it is there in judaism it is there in most of the religions today okay they have an other side to it so this other side that knowledge is creeping in and the jews were already there they brought this knowledge into so so what i am saying is it's something like mixing um occult with the religion that you follow and they fuse both of them together and this is what these gnostics did they got their knowledge not from the bible they acquired it from a mystical plane so some of these people are involved in occultic activities already and they have some knowledge and then they bring it into inside the church now in this case that's what they did they see themselves as elevated people with higher spiritual levels of understanding and therefore everybody else is below them and they're proud of their knowledge they're really so, evil people these days see the thing is this we we would look at them and say oh that guy is evil but actually they didn't look like they were evil they look like people with higher uh, understanding now in your own word understanding which denomination of christ today has this problem most dangerous i think brethren people brethren ah huh? brethren people has this problem like they have a lot of knowledge they'll emphasize on knowledge more than so you are taking number 2 but you missed number 1 pentecostal pentecostal and charismatics are the ones in the most danger yes what do you think nan sondam palle kutam parayamattu 
it's not about um, it's not about finding fault oh, church, it's yeah. who is in danger the most because which churches are more spiritually aware or they are, they are actually seeking spiritual things renji there's say all the churches uh, they they are speaking sp- uh, spiritual uh, seeking spiritual uh, uh, you know enlightenment or uh, you know uh, a uh, 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 clarity but the, uh, but the thing is that all the churches when you when you see everybody has got a, a certain deviation uh, <clears throat> which kind of blinds even the members of the church as well as the, the leaders so, I'll, i'll pose this question in a different way which church actually uh, which denominations which are actually involved with self in the study of the word of god i'm talking about really intense ppm ppm is one brethren yeah witness is another one pentecostal and brethren yeah so then then you add to the spirit side to it so when you have what what happens is many of the ministries that are coming up nowadays where are they getting you've heard of angel dust you have you know these weird stuff that are going on where does this knowledge come from that is my question is it there in the bible no it's not there in the bible so where are they and they preach on these things where is this idea coming from they have uh, how do you say angelic ministries where are they getting this material from is it from the scripture no because they're no. preaching it to the people and teaching them this it's not just preaching a word and saying something like this happened but they are actually involving in training people to do the same thing it is gnosticism of a different category there are it's so wide you cannot actually say this is what is gnosticism no i'm just giving you two points it is so vast you don't know the difference between which is what that's the level that has happened now in the in this world and i would ask people to whenever you want to look into this just check out the new apostolic reformation movement which is currently going on okay new apostolic reformation period okay it's called n uh, n a r nar okay so with all the spiritual enlightenment and discernment and all these things that the ephesian church had they failed to find this movement inside them paul established his church in ad 52 this church died in ad 200 by 200 go back go back at you not yet finished so when god said i'll take away your lamp stand he literally took away the lamp stand the light was removed from ephesus the church died in ad 200 the light was taken away the people of ephesus had no gospel preached to them for god knows how many years after that there's nothing there now no the church doesn't exist there yeah. is no church at ephesus he removed it so i asked some so all islam is so islam is now huh it's for all islam now in all that all the yeah, so turkey is 99.9.99.5 percentage islamic it's only 0.5 percentage of whatever religion else is there right so false doctrine was present then false doctrine is present today and it is still very much active the most important thing for us to learn from the efficient church is one maintain your first love second be aware of what god is warning the reason why efficient church is first addressed from the seven churches for me personally is because he's introducing the church to what is going to come and what the church has first lost and if you look at the state of churches today the first thing that lost is doctrine it means like teaching that is the first thing that has gone off as i said we have that more than 35000 denominations where did it started somebody started teaching wrong things it started with one guy and it has now gone exploded right the church has lost the teaching and that teaching is even lacking today also today we are more interested in preaching there is the difference between preaching and teaching preaching is just encouragement words 
teaching is actually establishing the roots of the believer which is sadly lacking and now if even if you have teaching the teaching is more denominationally correct than right with god yeah so the people are the ones suffering because people from their childhood they they don't know the difference between left and right so therefore they just go with whatever they have that's how they are growing i can't blame but this is what is the current situation now what is happening the church is being under prepared in the sense now there's two sides to working this satan doesn't want the church to understand what is going to come and what is going to happen they are making them blind that is why the book of revelations many people don't even want to teach many people don't even want to go there they don't want to discuss it they don't want to touch it and even if they touch it it is something else totally opposite why that is being done is because to confuse the people so that they are never ever going to be prepared okay and the amount of doctrines that are there i will teach as it, as the time goes it's crazy is there a way to purge these uh, evil cults from the church because they will rise up again and again they will they are like weeds you can't remove them so you like a constant weeding process need to be there like a pruning process only god can weed them out yes only god can weed them out we ourselves we cannot weed out i if personally i can teach people but then i can't change people i can't change the church i can't change the doctrines inside the denominations that's not i can't do those things but i can empower people to understand and see and know what is going on and make their own decisions come to their own conclusions examine it's all see what i personally feel is i should and i my job is to empower those who hear with information that they can use for their own personal life i am not here to change anybody that is holy spirit job not my job so what's happening satan's plan in this is to under prepare or under inform uh, so that you know see he, what he's doing he's blinding the eyes of men that they should not see the truth so that's what he's doing he's doing a fantastic job and what is god doing he is making people aware also so you have both things going simultaneously but which is which is working out that guy has had the last 2000 years to do mess up and he's messed it up really bad because people love darkness more than light because when you come to light you your stuff is exposed and you don't want to be exposed so you prefer the other one so this is quite prevalent even today nobody wants to have a, a change of view moment you charge go to change view they start killing you are a heretic or your heresy and this and blah blah now what is so important about the right teaching hosea 4:6 says this my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge i also will reject you from being a priest before me who is he talking about he is talking about unbelievers or he is talking about look at who is he telling this priest that means somebody who is close to god okay because you have forgotten the law of god they have forgotten the word of god right therefore i will forget your children not you i will forget your children what a what a thing to say here matthew chapter 24 verse 24 look at this for false christs and false prophets will rise and they will do what what are their job what is their job is to show to great see. signs and wonders so they are going to be spiritually mighty what is the intention behind it is to deceive general population if possible even the elect please understand what is coming if we are not able to understand which is what we will be falling look at second peter 2 verse 1 to 3 and verse 18 there will also be false prophets among you it's not from outside it's among you even as there will be false teachers among you so you have false prophets and you have false teachers among us who will secretly bring destructive heresies even denying the lord who brought them uh, who bought them okay that means the blood of christ also is being questioned here okay and bring on themselves swift destruction and many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed so that people in the church are going to blaspheme when they follow these wrong doctrines so in other words there is always a danger that we can blaspheme what god has done okay by covetousness they will exploit you at, with deceptive words so be very careful for they will speak great swelling words of emptiness 
no spiritual truth in it but it will look like it's something great they will allure you through the lust of the flesh through lewdness again it's going back to the he's mentioning that nicolosianism kind of thing it's gnosticism nicolosianism from all directions you won't know which is what it looks like it's more spiritual right the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error so that means these are the people in error we already know what the idea is to get the people who escaped the error to bring back them into error am um, are we talking about something very simple here or is it of high priority and importance Yes, it's important. Yes, of High priority and importance. It's not simple. It is not simple. No. I don't. I don't think the majority of people are even prepared for what this actually means. What is the level of game Satan will play inside the church? We don't even know. I'll give yeah, you something. Satan can manipulate any one of us to to say yeah. those blasphemous things. I'll give you something yeah. else. what did the efficients escape from initially what was the cult diana diana's cult so basically they were worshiping the god of goddess of heaven right yes or uh, the queen of heaven as the term goes something that you know when jesus said to john John here is your mother and mother this is your son and because of that John took Mary along with him and stayed in Ephesus you would think that is a normal thing it's good very nice uh, John obeyed Jesus Christ uh, Jesus was so was a responsible son and that is why you know uh, he took her it was a, such a nice thing to do you know what happened out of this i'll tell you it's surprising there was a stigmatized german now anybody know what is stigmata have you ever heard of the term stigmata a stigma is something bad that is associated with a certain no 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 that, that's a different thing stigma is different stigmata is different don't that say stigmatism in the eyes alla ada stigmatism aanti <laughs> what is astigmatism is the curvature of the lens not not that this is stigmata stigmata sight okay stigmata i will tell you what it is ha huh? it's a sort of belief uh, no it's little more than that stigmata is when a person is so how do you say so involved in something that they begin to demonstrate on their own bodies the wounds of christ they start developing wounds they'll have the the nail pierced hands they will have the wound on the side they will have the flogging marks the crown of thorns they start bleeding from their head these kind of weird stuff and there are many who are recorded having this on their bodies one is father peyo quite famous okay and here that is why they saying there was a german nun who was having the same thing a stigmatized german nun who has never been to ephesus had a vision okay of the house of the virgin mary and she described this to a writer his name is Cle clemens brentano who then later published a book and this uh, this lady later on what happens is there's in 1891 paul superior of the lazarus okay so it's an order based on lazarus who are located in izmir now izmir is nothing but smyrna okay izmir is the current name or the uh, the local name for smyrna this man took this book and he read it when he read it he corresponded with a place that he himself knew and he found this house that was there and uh, and began to say that this is the house that this lady saw the stigmatized german nun saw and then archaeology also began to agree to it because the foundations of that house goes back to first century ad so the catholic church then declared this to be a shrine in 1896 and therefore today also it is a popular place for pilgrimage worshiping whom 
Mary. Exactly. Now, this is all coming in Ephesus. The third ecumenical council was held in Ephesus, okay, in 431 AD. And here the character of Jesus Christ and, Ma and Mary or Virgin Mary was discussed. There were two sides to it. The side that won decided that Christ has double nature. That nature of as God and as man. We say that, you know, Christ was holy God and holy man at the same time. They say the same thing too, but they added one more thing to it. Now the Virgin Mary was declared as Theotokos. That means God bearer or in other words, mother of God. The church of Ephesus became the first site for Mary worship. The first church was established in Ephesus. The Ephesians began return to a Christianized version of the worship of Diana because Diana and Mary are both called Queen of Heaven today. And I'll give you something even more ancient. Look at Jeremiah 7, 18. The children gather wood, the fathers kindle the fire, the women knead dough to make cakes or for the Queen of Heaven. They pour out their drink offerings to other gods that they may provoke me to anger. And by the way, he's not talking about Diana or he's ta not talking about Mary here. This is somebody else, but they are also called Queen, Queen of, of Heaven. Heaven. Yeah, so this Queen of Heaven terminology is not, it's predating all of this. And I will show you that later on. But just to show you, God brought the light into a land polluted by the Queen of Heaven. And then because they didn't repent and they didn't stand and they didn't represent him properly, he removed the lampstand from them. The light was taken away. What did the land go back to? Back to worship of Queen Idol of Heaven. Yeah. Only yeah. now it has got a different form. Got a Christianized form now. So this is why it says, you know, if you if you come to come to the knowledge of Christ and you then go back, your situation is going to be far worse than what you started with. You look at Ephesians today. There is no Ephesians, by the way. Ephesus is completely destroyed. It's a how do you say archaeological site now? So from where to where? the Ephesian church went. This is something that we need to look into our own lives. Where are we headed? As a church or as an individual? What are we doing? Are we teaching the right things to our people and to the next generation? And if we are teaching, what is the content of our teachings? Where is the basis of our teachings? Are we teaching the first uh, to pe people to come back to Christ? Because we cannot go far from him. Because if we go far from him, this is what's going to follow. When the light is far away from you, darkness will be the one that comes in. And this is what happened in Ephesian Church. Ranji, sorry, one second. Can you show the uh, previous screen? That... This one? Yeah. Okay. One. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Can I please ask a doubt? Yes, sir. Uh, who, who gave the name uh, Queen of Heaven? It's far. Heaven? It's far older. It's an old term. I will teach that when the time comes. Right now, okay. I just wanted to show you that the start of the church and the end of the church. Okay. Okay. But Queen okay. of Heaven is quite prominent. It's not just in one verse. There's a whole bunch of verses that talks about her and I will introduce her later. Okay, okay. Like Lucifer, he is also called the morning star. Morning star. Ah, but and yeah. Jesus, huh? He is the bright morning star. And Jesus is called the morning star. The bright morning star. Okay. And the angels are called also morning stars. We yes. talked about it last session. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So all angels are morning stars. Yes. Jesus is the morning star. The bright morning star. Yes. 
And occult, I said, what is the morning star? It's actually the planet Venus. Yes. God has a different meaning. The other side has a different meaning. All right. So that is. Hmm. So that is the study of the Church of Ephesus. I can go more deeper into this, but then you know it defeats the purpose. I think it'll be too much. Um, the the prime thing I want you guys to take away is the fact that he addresses the Ephesian church first because of the spiritual awareness that they had and they lost it, which is very important for today's church also. Because today's yes. church is not aware of things that are going to happen. They are not spiritually aware. They have a lot of knowledge, but they're not spiritually aware. Right? This is the church that had a revival to the point where occultic books and uh, people who practice sorcery and whatever witchcraft that was there all burned their books and came to Christ. mighty revival in the land. They were uh, they were changing the landscape of the entire Ephesus. Okay, to the point that the uh, the worship of Diana was going down the drain. And then Paul, who was watching over their souls, left. And once he left, the people did not continue to engage themselves with God, but rather engage themselves with other things that were, you know, more flesh oriented than God oriented. And they ended up losing everything. They lost. They had a lot of activities. They had a lot of awareness, this, that. Everything was there. But they lost continuous revelation from God. They were regurgitating and feeding their kids. Regurgitating and feeding their kids. The same thing that has been talked from A to Z. They have already covered it. The same thing. Nothing new was being preached. Therefore, the church over a period of time, died out for the lack of new oil. The light cannot burn. You will not be able to renew. And therefore, the lampstand became out, light taken out, darkness moved in, wrong doctrine began to win, and finally, the church in Ephesus ceased yes. to exist in 200, by 200 AD. In, 100, 100, in 150 years, done. Finished. Now, look at Turkey. It's illegal to preach the gospel there. It is illegal to distribute Bibles there and all those things. That's the condition that we have come. But there's Christians there. God is still working. He's still working. He's not left it. But he left it for a time period. So, it is a very dangerous thing. And as we have been looking at God as sovereign over space and time, how would you apply this in this study? Today's. Well, he, he specifically told exactly what was going to happen and people still didn't take it. He told them that these people are going to come in. He warned them. Any more warnings, they literally will have to have when the bad guy comes into the uh, in, into your midst, they, you should light him up with uh, with sort of, uh, you know, with lights and strobe lights to say, oh, this is a wrong doctor. No, nobody's going to do that. But he told them. He told them the answer, he told them the problem, and he told what will happen if in case you don't follow. He knows exactly what's going to happen. And therefore, again, God is sovereign over space and time, and he's telling you ahead of time so that we are prepared. Even today, this study, the Ephesian church is for our present-day church who, who wants a revival, who is in, who would be actively participating in revivals, but sadly, nothing is happening. No movement is taking place. We are, do we get re continuous revelation? That is the question. If we are not, then we are in danger. And also the fact that, you know, the revelation that we get, we always need to look through it from a lens, from what the word of God says. Absolutely. That, that is where, see, because when you move out into the spiritual realm, we will find things that are not coming from God also, as deceiving as it is something from God. Absolutely. But how do you discern it? It's not that we take everything. Yes. Correctly put, Abby. So I encourage everybody to just look at 
what's going on around them uh, meditate on what you have studied today uh, i'll see you guys next week uh, can someone close in prayer anyone father we thank you for this morning oh lord we thank you lord for being with us oh father for everything that you have spoken to us this day oh father god lord just as lord you have you had warned the church at Ephesus so father god lord lord you're warning even us today oh father and i pray lord jesus each and every word and each and every warnings and each and every alertness that you are lord bringing to our uh, 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 sight oh father god lord help us a lot to heed into it oh father god lord help us to be aware help us to be alert oh father god lord and i pray that your spirit of oh father god lord will guide us into all truth to father god lord jesus hallelujah i pray father god lord that we will walk in our first love of father god lord help us of father god lord let that fire burn again of father god lord rekindle that fire of father god lord lord i pray that let that fire burn bright in our lives of father that we will Father God, Lord, never depart, oh Father God, Lord, from that first love that you had put in our hearts, oh Father God, Lord Jesus, hallelujah, and help us, oh Father God, Lord, to be very attentive, oh Father God, Lord, to the call of the Spirit, oh Father. We surrender ourselves, we surrender our families, we surrender our loved ones, oh Father God, Lord, and we surrender before this word, oh Father God, Lord. Seal each one of us, protect us, preserve us, oh Father God, Lord. And Lord, in your appointed time, bring us back again, oh Father. Thank you, Lord, for your wonderful love. All this we ask in Jesus' mighty and matchless name. Amen. Amen. Amen.